Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Crosswalk Church. I'm Pastor Armand Agnew, and we are experiencing one of those dreary, weary, rainy Sunday mornings here in Florida, but we have a house full of folk here. Good morning, Crosswalk Church. How is everybody? We're all trying to recover from Thanksgiving. Y'all know who that is. You eat too much and you don't exercise enough. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, I think they did. But we want to welcome everybody watching us live this morning by Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, whichever. You may be watching us later in the week. Welcome into our service today. Today, we're going to be looking at gardens. How many of y'all are good at gardens? I know Bill and Sandra have a like their whole backyard. Half of their backyard is full of all kinds of good things. And from what I'm hearing from some of our folks is their gardens have bloomed twice because the weather's been so good. Well, I think that's about to end this week as we go into the 30s here in Florida. So that's going to be fun, but I kind of like the change. Today, we're going to be looking at the Garden of Christianity. Now, I found this little story. I think it's by D.L. Moody. I'm not sure, but it made a really cool little sermon. So we're going to look at that today. But here's a question I want to ask you. Are you living a life that pleases God, a life that is exemplifying your salvation? Huh. Well, we're going to know that today. We're going to look at four things about a garden. But before I get there, let me give you a verse. I love this verse. This is in the New Living uh, Translation. Let me move over just a little bit so you can read this. It says this in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So, dear brother and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. How many of y'all think that that's a good idea? Because of what God has done for us? We need to give him everything about us. Harrison just talked about that when he was receiving the offering just now. And he goes on, it says, um, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. Now, I'll get to that in a minute. Let me go on. This is truly the way to worship him. Well, look at this. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, how you process things. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, one of the things I like to challenge believers with is, are we really living a Christian life? Or are we just saying that we're believers, that we're Christians, and we're doing the whole buzzword thing, and you know we're going through the motions, but really we look more like the world than we do like Christ? And that's a big challenge in the church today. It's a big challenge with every generation. People want in the world today. People want to be accepted. They want to be successful, whatever, whatever. And what we need to understand today is, what does God expect from us? Let me give you a little bit of, of Greek here because I want you to see that it used the word acceptable or reasonable. The Greek word is uh, logikos. We get our word what? Logical, but not like logical in the world. It means using your spiritual intelligence, being a new creature and not a ritual or compulsion. How many of y'all are compulsive? I'm looking for hands. How about you? You're compulsive. Quit pointing at people today. I'll do that. How many of y'all are compulsive shoppers? Eh, not some of yeah. Black Friday is a good reason to be a compulsive shopper. Look, it's 50% off. But we already have four of them. Yeah, but it's a good deal. How many of y'all shop like that? And a lot of times we do things just out of what we do every day. We get in a grind. We get in a rut or whatever. And we live our lives by that. And I put together a little quote here. People live thinking they're saved, but are in reality not living saved. Let me say that again. People live thinking they're saved. They go through life. They do the whole thing. Get up in the morning at the Lauren Clock's morning. Take the 815 to the city. That's a song, right? We do the same thing. Thank you. My older people know these. We, we break in the song. Everyone's going, 
But think about it. You know, our lives can become that nine to five or what. I don't even think it's nine to five anymore, just whatever. And we get in that routine. We get up, we get the kids off. We get up, we get a break, whatever. We go to work, we come home, but we're tired. And we get up and we do the same thing every day. And once in a while, we'll throw God a bone. Every once in a while, we'll open our Bible. Every once in a while, we'll attend church. Here I am, pastor. Are you glad to see me? Here I am, God, you know, here I am, aren't you glad? And we don't really live like we're saved. Somebody say amen. Now, I'm going to show you some things today that a garden would have to put it in perspective. This is going to be kind of fun. Are y'all ready? So get your pens out, your pencils out or whatever, and uh, we're going to jump right into the garden. By the way, how many of y'all are good at gardens? Two of y'all. Okay. How many of y'all, you just can't do it? We killed a rock garden one year. We don't garden. We don't have green thumbs. We're struggling here. We are struggling. Okay, are you ready? Four things. Here we go. I love this. Plant five rows of peas. How many of you like peas? Remember in... Elementary school, you didn't eat the peas. You shove them into your milk carton because you couldn't turn the plate in with food on it. How many did that? So you, you thank you. You'd stuff your peas in an empty milk carton to disguise your evil deed. You were not that smart. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like peas back then. I kind of like peas now. How many of y'all like peas? Black-eyed peas. Yeah, well, I'm talking about the green peas. Yeah. Okay, so you need to plant. If you're going to live for Christ and you know it, if you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. If you're saved, oh, it's happy. I'm changing everything today. We're doing a paradigm shift. If you're saved today and you know it, clap your hands. Here they are, five Ps. P number one, preparedness. We don't always live our lives like we're prepared for the return of the Lord, do we? We can get bogged down by the things of life. Listen, uh, we actually, in reality, need to be prepared for whatever the day brings on by having a devotion in the morning, having a, a prayer time, having a word time where the word comes in and it works all the, the kinks out of you. Come on, how many of y'all know the older we get, the more kinks we have when we get up? Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, your right leg doesn't work. Your eyes are still like, unless you're, how many of y'all are morning people? You jump up and you're like, woo, yeah, I'm ready to take on the day. But some of y'all are like noon before you, you know, you've been up since six, but it's like noon before all of a sudden you go, oh, I'm awake. I can do this. Preparedness. This is, this pea that we plant is all about keeping God in the forefront of our lives. How many of you are ready for Jesus to come back now? Well, last Monday morning, we were on our trip, and we got a little bit delayed. I had some back problems. But I ended up in the ER with a kidney stone. And I tell you what, for a couple of hours, I was praying for the rapture. I was just praying God would take me home right then. I was in some pain. That is a reality check. Somebody say amen. Have you ever been there? The things gotten so bad, you're like, God, just come. This is terrible. And we, but we need to be prepared when things are great. I'm ready for the Lord to come back. Even though everything's fine, I'm ready for God to come back. Promptness. The second P, promptness. I always heard this uh, in any of the, the teachings that I did. I, I did some uh, training for uh, management, for, for plant management stuff. It had to do with my job when I was in uh, at Cathedral of the Cross, I was the management of the pastors and, and things. And one of the things they told you was that when you're not prompt, it means you don't care. Now, I'm just going to preach what I found here. You know, the chips are going to fall where they are. But when you're not prompt, listen, prompt to me is like, I, I got to be there five minutes early. How many of y'all are that way? How many of y'all like to drag in 10 minutes late? I'm watching you over there. Promptness. We need to put the P of promptness in there. How about perseverance? Keeping our eyes 
on the prize. You're never going to persevere through your trial. You're never going to persevere through persecution. You're never going to persevere through those things in life, in the world that's, that the world brings to your door if you're not settled. I just preached this in the service earlier in our uh, valleys, deserts, and high places on the desert of conviction. But if we're not uh, settled in and convicted in in, in a no compromising situation, we're never going to persevere for God. Somebody say amen. We got to believe that. Here's the next one. Politeness. This is our relationship with others. How many of y'all need to work on this one? How many of y'all are just super polite? It's okay. You can raise your hand. Those that are out there, yeah. Listen, polite. God wants us to be polite. Now, we just drove to Louisiana. It's about 12 hours one way. It's terrible. And I tell you what, the people driving are not polite. I hate that drive. Listen, I hate the way people are, man. I mean, uh, we were coming. It was like nobody around. I was getting ready to pass this semi. And all of a sudden, I mean, I don't know how he didn't hit me. He just went, boom, right over in front of me. And I'm like, I had to hit the brakes. I'm like, what in the world? People are, you know, we're not polite. Listen, we need to treat people like we want to be treated. Please listen to me. As a believer today, we need to treat people good. Even if they treat us bad, we still need to be polite. Because if we continue to carry things and we continue to be mad at people and you know uh, allow them to get to us, we're never going to understand what it is to walk as a saved believer. A lot of people aren't walking saved today. They're bound up by these things. They're bound up by all the things that the world has. We are not of this world. We shouldn't be affected like the world is affected. Somebody say amen. This is Garden Christianity 101. Politeness. Prayer. The fifth P is prayer. Listen, if you're not praying, I mean regularly praying, I'm not talking about just when things are bad, but I'm talking about regularly praying believing that God is working in your life and your family, that God can and will do things, then you're missing what God has for you. Here's my verse. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. This is all about being for God. Come on, on our guard. Wait, we know the enemy's coming. We're on guard. We're, it, we shouldn't be taken unexpected. Come on. Standing firm. Listen, when the time comes and the enemy's flowing in and things are bad and people are bad, stand firm in our faith, being courageous and strong because we know how it's going to end. We know that this is part of being a saved believer. This is walking in your salvation. Here's the next one. You need to plant. Everybody likes peas, but everybody likes squash. You need to plant three rows. Of squash, Sabi. You need to squash gossip. You need to squash criticism. And you need to squash indifference. How many of y'all think that's good? I thought that was pretty amazing. How many of y'all like squash? I like squash. Do you like squash? I, how many of y'all like casserole? I like it fried with a little bit crunchy, you know, and soft at the same time. I like squash. Squash is good. I used to not like squash, and I would probably put it in my milk carton, just like Susan did. Listen, we need to squash gossip. You know what gossip is all about? Gossip is trying to make yourself elevated above someone else. Because if you can gossip about somebody and make them, you know, look smaller than you, we have this sense of, well, this makes me better. This makes me something else. How about criticism? How many of y'all remember, what was it, Bambi? There was a little rabbit in Bambi. His name was Thumper. And what did Thumper's mom say? If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. I think that's a pretty good concept. Listen, criticism is the same thing. It's our attempt to tear someone else down so that we feel better about ourselves. But when we look at ourselves in the light of the gospel, we're, we're, we're miserable. Come on, if you want to criticize somebody, criticize yourself. Let the Holy Spirit criticize you. And indifferent, listen, we really need to understand that uh, the negative needs to be squashed 
in our lives. Here's a good verse. Proverbs 18.21. How many of y'all getting this in your garden today? The tongue can bring death or life. If you get up in the morning, I just realized my shirt matched that graphic. Pretty good. My birthday gift. If you get up in the morning and you go, this is going to be a terrible, terrible day. It's already started bad. It can't get any better. Guess what your day is going to be like? Yeah, because there's power in the tongue. And you can be having a bad day. Nothing can be working. And you can just begin to say, I'm going to give God praise. I'm going to be thankful for the trials. I'm going to give God the glory. Listen, that is walking in your salvation. And it will change the attitude in you and those things around you. I might say amen. amen. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So the power of the tongue, if you're criticizing others and you're criticizing the situation and nothing is right at work and you don't have anything good to say about your boss, you don't have anything good to say about work, well, no wonder you're miserable at work. No wonder you don't get along with anybody. You're not walking as a saved person. Squash it. Everybody say squash it. Squash it. Squash it. All right, here's the next one. Are you ready? We're going to do five rows of lettuce. How many of y'all like lettuce? That tasteless texture of a whatever it is. Lettuce. Here we go. Let us be faithful. Somebody say amen. Let us be unselfish. Let us be loyal. Let us be truthful. Let us love. Everybody say love. love. Everybody say love one another. And that isn't a selective thing that you get to choose. You don't get to choose who you love. What? No. For God so loved the what? He didn't say he just loved a certain group of people. He didn't say he loved, you know, whatever. He said he loved the world. One of the things we need to understand, if you're going to walk in your salvation, you're going to have to love people. Everybody. I get a kick out of this little story. I have a relative, they're, they're going through some unforgiveness stuff, and I started praying that their priest would preach on forgiveness. And uh, sure enough, the, within a couple of weeks, how many of you have power in prayer? The priest preached on forgiveness. And they were telling another relative in my family, yeah, yeah the priest was preaching on unforgiveness and, and forgiveness, and I did. And they said, well, what about this person in the family? You haven't forgiven them. Oh, I'll never forgive them. We can't pick and choose what we want to do. Somebody say, man, come on. When God says to forgive, we forgive. Listen, when God says to be faithful, we need to be faithful to the things of God. When he says to be unselfish, uh, my youngest daughter, Carly, she, was, she had a saying. If she had it in her hands, it was hers. If she wanted it, it was hers. If you had it in your hands and she wanted it, it was hers. And she would try to get it. So unlike Alyssa, my, old, my oldest daughter, now they all grew out of Alyssa, but my oldest daughter was to give it. But Carly was like all about, you know, when they're little, how they do, just total extremes. I love you, Carly. I hope you're watching because you're not selfish anymore. We need to learn to be unselfish. Let somebody else go first. Let somebody else win the argument. Man, how could that be? How can we let somebody win the argument? We must win the argument till the last breath. Are y'all getting what I'm saying today? We all do this. Let us be truthful, even though it costs us. I talked about it in my Bible study earlier today about doing the right thing that cost us something. But we're doing the right thing. And we need to understand that we need to be truthful. We don't need to lie to cover things up. Somebody say amen. How many of you have ever just 
took it on the chin. You didn't lie and you knew what was going to happen and you did it. You told the truth and it, it cost you. Well, we need to be truthful. That is walking in your salvation. Hiding things in lying is not. Come on, somebody say amen. Here's Philippians. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Everybody say that with me. Do everything. Do everything. Wouldn't that be great? If our kids would just, oh, yes, I was in church this morning and Pastor Armand talked about, you know, not complaining and arguing. I'm going to be an angel today. Or even adults, man, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to complain about the weather. I'm not going to complain about my, my uh, rheumatism, rheumat whatever. I'm not going to complain about my ache in my feet, my back. How many of y'all know complaining doesn't do any good? Sometimes it makes you feel better. Well, not really. Arguing, let's not argue it. I hate confrontation. How many of y'all like confrontations? I hate confrontations. I hate it because it gets me upset. Anybody else? It'll mess me up for a couple days. I just hate it. I hate arguments. And I believe that we can disarm a lot of things before I say, man, are you ready for number four? I know not everybody likes these, and I have a problem with them. How about three rows of turnips? How many of y'all love turnips? I think turnips are part of the curse. You know, turnip greens, any kind of, uh, turn ups. Are y'all ready for this? Here we go. If you want to live a life that is saved, you're going to turn up for church. If, you, if you're a believer and you're saved, you're going to be at church. Not only are you going to be at church, you're going to be excited to be at church. If you're walking in salvation, come on, church, turn up with a smile. Let me see everybody smile. Some of you are like, I'm here and I'm happy. Smile and turn up with determination. Come on. It's a turn up. It means I'm going to get into that church and I'm going to be determined to be the best I can be in that church. And I'm going to help that church to grow. I'm going to help that church to worship God. I am not going to be a spectator. I'm going to get down on the field and I'm going to get my hands involved in what I need to get involved in. Come on, somebody say amen. Good things. Here it is, Romans, for all the turnips. Romans 15, 13, I pray that God, the source of hope, my wife's on it, hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Why? Because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't move through you because you choked Him out. Come on, the Holy Spirit can't work in a vessel that's all negative and all down and critical and is not walking in, in a light that's saved. The Holy Spirit comes out and really begins to, to flow through you when you allow Him to flow through you and say, I am going to walk for God. Come on, somebody say amen. That is good. Let me close with this little story. Dr. Wilbur Chapman had this which he called my rule for Christian living. The rule that governs my life is this. Anything that dims my vision of Christ or takes away my taste for, the, for Bible study or cramps my prayer life or makes Christian work difficult is wrong for me. And I must, as a Christian, turn away from it. Whatever puts a damper on my Christian walk, in the world. I must walk away from it. If you're constantly running into that person that just, no matter what happens, they want to have a conflict or toxic, stay away from them. 
Come on, somebody say, if you love them and pray for them, maybe, you know, it, it's a situation that uh, uh, entices you by friends or whatever to, to skip church and go do this or not read your Bible because you wanted to sleep in an extra 10 minutes, whatever. Listen, we need to get to the place where we're walking like we are saved. Somebody say amen. Because that's who Christ is coming for. Those who walk like they're saved. Amen? So I thought that was kind of neat. The garden of Christianity. So plant those things. Plant your row of peas. Plant your squash. Plant your lettuce. And don't forget the turnips. Amen. Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you right now. God, for everyone watching, everyone in the house church today. God, that we would take these things to heart, that we would begin to understand, God, these are the things that are, we are going to possess as a saved believer. God, as one walking like Christ, a true disciple. And Lord, I pray for everyone watching, everyone in the house, God, that they would take these things, God, and plant them in their lives. God, take the word, the, the verses today, and God, let it become real to us. God, help us to walk that walk, God, so that when you return, we will be ready. We'll be prepared. And not only then, but God, that we're making a difference in the world around us, that we're changing our world. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you uh, turned up and, and enjoyed this message. And we pray that you will join us again next week. Until then, God bless you and keep on keeping on for the Lord. Thank you.